give a little more breathing room. Oh, there we go. <laughs> We're glad you're here today, and we really hope the music we bring you and the message we bring you touches your soul and reminds you what Christmas is really all about. So let's worship. Good morning. Please, please join me in the call to worship. Please stand. The Lord was holding each of us this past night like a weighted blanket of love and care. The Lord was watching us rise this morning like a spring of water welling off, lifting us. Let us recognize the Lord's present on this day. Let us recognize the Lord's presence on this day. Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord God, let your blessing come upon us as we light the candles of the reed, sing your songs of Christmas, and engage your living word. May the light, a sign of Christ's promise to bring us salvation and peace. May the Prince of Peace come quickly and not delay. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, we'll be singing O, Holy, o Little Town of Bethlehem and stay standing for that. <laughs> seated now.
The light of a candle always starts as a spark, a wick, and the possibility of light and warmth. The flame of peace always starts from a single spark of hope, love, and joy. The journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem began with one step of faith. Let our journey from conflict to peace begin with one candle, one hope, one God. Let this candle of peace ignite in each of us the possibility of peace in our hearts and in the world. Today's scripture comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place when Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone went down to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the child to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. God's words for God's people.
Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Praise God, praise God. We're so grateful that, uh, that Ryan has been able to come and be our guest conductor today. So thank you, Ryan, for being here. And then Dr. Keith, uh, he is from uh, Pepperdine also and is head of the, is it the opera department? So welcome, Keith. We're glad you're here. And also, Eston, are you a, is it Eston or Eston? Eston. And Eston, you're a student at Pepperdine, is that right? You're a senior. Uh, you looking for a job? Nathan, our chair of SBRC, is in the back of the room. He'll be, he'll be getting you coffee after, maybe. So. <laughs> so we're so grateful that you're here. Thank you. And for Kevin, our own, uh, we thank you so much. But most of all, this was really about our choir and them coming back and sharing their voices with us and singing with us. So choir, yay for you. Yay for you. Wouldn't it have been cool if there had been a whole group of people, enthusiastic people, people who just showed up at the birth of Jesus just waiting for it to happen? Can you imagine what Mary would have felt if there had been a crowd around there? I mean, not, not while the birth is actually going on, but <laughs> right after that, you know, going, yay, Jesus, you made it into the world. Mary, good job. Joseph, oh, you did such a great job. But I'm not sure that's how it really happened. And nothing became more real to me than when I actually got to visit Israel in 1986 for the first time. And I went to the church of, of the, in Bethlehem and the church of the Nativity. And the very first thing that strikes you as you walk into the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, which I'm not even sure you can do these days because of all that's going on uh, in the world, but the doorway is about this tall. In fact... Uh, I think only you guys could make it through there, actually. You could just go on through, but you couldn't even walk, you couldn't even walk straight through the door. You'd actually have to go about two steps in, and then you have to go to the right, and then you got to go to the left, and I think there's one more little turn there, and then you go into this great big room that has been claimed by four different churches. And it's like they drew lines on the floor and said, okay, you can be over here, and you can be over here, and you can be over here, and you can be over here. Now, the Greek Orthodox actually watch over this church more so than any other group. But, uh, and it looks, it's amazing. It's got all this ornamentation. It's, it's, it's gold and silver and got all sorts of lights. And it's just, it's just, well, I would call it gaudy, but you don't say that out loud, especially if you're in the room there. Um, and uh, it's kind of a strange place because I was expecting to sort of walk in and see a manger scene. I was, I was kind of looking for one of these things in the front of the room or some sort of depiction of them coming to Bethlehem. But in fact, it's just bigger candles and lots of more gold and, and uh, all sorts of decorations and then a whole group of saints that are up there, very, very orthodox looking. And so as we walked in and we walked into the room and we're, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm at the place traditionally believed that Jesus was actually born. And I'm thinking there's got to be a manger somewhere in here, right? So we're walking around the 12 pastors and our guide who was Jewish, you know, I get the irony of that later, but, um, you know, we were walking around the room and we realized, first of all, that we were privileged because it turns out our tour guide was a member of the parliament, the Israeli parliament, and he had keys to places that other people didn't have, so we were about the only ones in the room. We were the only ones there, which never happens. And he said, follow me, I'll show you the site where supposedly, this is speaking as a Jewish person, that, you know, Jesus was born, but we all know that we don't know exactly where that happened. And he's trying to downplay this while we're all getting more hyped up, but actually the birthplace they say, could be uh, about 30 feet underground. So you go around behind the altar and you walk down a flight of stairs either side, kind of like the old secret choir rooms, you know, of the old churches. You, you remember, you ever been in one of those? And they sort of emerge, you know, they sort of rise up on the stage, you know, on the chancel as they sing the first song. But this is, this is a hidden place. 
And the irony of that is that it's actually a cave. It's been hewn out of limestone. And that's probably a lie a lot of the ways people lived in those days. Uh, the, the chances are that Jesus might have been born back in a cave somewhere. And a cave that the, the family lived in, but also the animals would live with them uh, for protection and for warmth for the people as well. And that's probably why there was a manger there. And so anyways, you enter this kind of dark sort of tunnel and you go down to this place. And then on the floor is a, is a hole in the ground and around the hole is a gold star, and it was weird. It's not a David star. It's not a, it's not a recognizable Christian symbol or any other sort of symbol. It's just sort of a, a, a place holder, so to speak, and that's where who was down there, actually the Greek Orthodox priest who was watching over to make sure you didn't get too close. Um, he said, yeah, that's, that's the spot where Jesus was born. My expectation just sort of like, my excitement, you know, the, the climax was not actually seeing the place where Jesus was born. As we left there and we walked around Bethlehem, I, I learned more about the reason the door is that way. And the reason it's that way is because there were too many years over literally thousands of years in which people would storm the castle. They would ride horses in. And people sometimes would get hurt or killed. And they would steal all the gold. They would pry up the gold star that was on the floor. I was told by the Orthodox priest um, there that that was probably the hundredth star they've had to put there that's been taken over the years. And, and the reason that the doorways, in fact, all of the gates in Jerusalem, old wall, old city, or the new city, um, are turned that way so that you couldn't ride a horse straight through this. You'd have to come in on foot, and that would give them a better chance to defend the place. And even today, the unrest and the lack of peace means that everything has to be protected and guarded, and, and things are, are uh, ornamental. They're sacred, but only for those who want to spend the time and energy to think about how precious this was, which really brings us to the passage today in Luke, because this whole thing about them going to Bethlehem to be registered, it was for taxation purposes. The reason that the emperor had anything to do with a census was not because they wanted to love people more or include people more. They wanted to know who, where people were. And they wanted to know how many people there were out there so they could then appropriately tax the citizens, particularly those who were not Roman. And Quirinus, he's, he's an interesting character. He actually is in history. We's, we can find him. Uh, but we find that he died about four years before this particular census was taken. So if this was the first census taken under him, either our history books are not exactly accurate or we find that he put in place this whole kind of system of making sure that taxation for Rome was being taken care of accordingly. But either way, it doesn't really matter. The thing we can understand is that the first journey to Bethlehem, uh, this journey that was going on, was actually uh, it was motivated by politics, really. Um, and I am not going to go into politics today, but I will tell you that this whole thing um, was really motivated by this group of people that wanted to find out where everybody was and how they were registered. Later on, unfortunately, Herod's going to use this information to do all kinds of things to find people and to bring them out of their homes and to either tax them either more or sometimes do worse things. And so the, the journey, the birth of Jesus, is becoming a world stage event, but not because people wanted to come and worship the Lord, God's gift to us. It was because Rome was really controlling the known world at the time. And if you read the headlines of papers in those days, which they didn't have, but if you, if you had a herald on the corner, they would say things like this, around zero, because you know zero comes from the birth of Jesus, right? So our whole calendar, our, our whole 2021 comes from the birth of Jesus, 2000, 
and 21 years ago, right? That's zero. And everything that happened before that is considered B.C. Uh, it's not really before Christ. It's something in Latin. Anyway, and then uh, there's the A.D., which is after death, which is not actually accurate either. It's also a Latin term that means after the birth of Christ. So, and there, it wasn't until three or 400 years after the birth of Christ that they tried to figure out what day was his birthday. I mean, we know it's Kevin's birthday. There's no doubt about that, right? <laughs> Happy birthday, Kevin. Yeah, uh, and the choir sang to him beautifully, and he played for his own birthday. I don't know if that's fair. <laughs> Not supposed to do that, but anyway. Um, but this whole point of trying to find year zero, there was a, a priest, uh, actually a monk, who was trying to figure that out. And we might be about four years off, which means, well, sorry, but this is really 2017. I know, I know, I know. And you're thinking, no, we don't need to do this all over again, right? So, so I, today, will pass an edict as pastor of the St. Matthews United Methodist Church that this officially is the year 2025. How's that? Yeah. Going forward. All right. All right. Yeah, well, yeah. It doesn't show. You look just the same you did in 2021. The political part of this, though, is that God's plan is in motion. Even the ruler of the Roman world is not going to stop the birth of Christ. Now, the second thing is that this was not an easy journey. This is a journey of peril for many reasons, particularly if you're in your ninth month of pregnancy and you've got to travel nine to ten days. They've gone back and mapped this out, and I've looked at many of these maps, and in one possible route they took was to go from Nazareth west, and that would have taken them down into the central part of Galilee, and that would have brought them down to the Sea of Tiberias, is what it was called at that time. We now call it the Sea of Galilee. And then from there, the River Jordan drains south, and that is one possible path that they took. That was about a 70-mile journey, and they would not walk more than 10 miles a day. It, treacherous terrain, there were no highways, there were no buses, there were no, there were no shortcuts, and there was no way to cross the river except the way you do river crossings. And the Jordan is not a huge river, by the way. It's, it's, there are points in which it's very narrow. Um, it, someday we'll talk about being baptized in the Jordan River. That was an experience, but it's, it's, again, kind of underwhelming. You think of this mighty river. The River Jordan is what? Deep and wide. So some of you remember these old songs, right? Well, it's not that deep and it's not that wide. But it is on certain days of the year because of the snow melt and the flow off of the Sea of Galilee. There is more water than less. But all of this is a reminder that they did real world travel. They, they walked this. If they were fortunate enough to have a donkey, that's great. We, we don't know. Whether they were by themselves or did this on their own, whether they did this with the blessing of their families as they left town, yet another strike against them because Mary already was probably not on good terms, but out the door and off to this place. Perilous because water was a big issue in those days. So we know that they took either the River Jordan route or they took what's called the King's Highway that would have been going past the Jezreel Valley and over to the coast, so they would have had more south, southwest at that point. Sorry, the first direction was east and southwest. And as they're heading down there, the coast, they would find places where they could actually find water. That would have been more like a 90-mile trip. And that's only on good ground. So we could add another 30 miles to that, and so we can figure that this trip that took a week or two, maybe three, finally got them there. Peril, because traveling by yourselves in those days was just as dangerous as it is to walk through some inner city by yourself at night for two or three weeks. It's, it's really not uh, unheard of in those days for there to be robbers along the way. There would be people who had attacked, you know, people that were not in caravans, that you were in smaller numbers. And besides, what is Mary going to do if she starts to have this baby halfway through the trip? There's no Walgreens on the corner. 
There's nobody to say, hey, go get towels and hot water. Now, I don't really, I mean, I'm not really an expert on birthing, but why is everybody in the movie running after towels and hot water? I don't get it. What is the hot water? Well, whatever. I don't want to know. I just got to say, I think that was probably something to get whoever out of the hair of the people who were actually having the baby. But the idea was that there was no place for them to go. There was no room for them anywhere, really. And that just talks to the importance of this for them. There was a purpose in this. See, Mary already knows that she's carrying the Son of God. She's been told that his name will be Jesus. Actually, Joseph gets the actual name, and she gets Emmanuel. And so why we're not worshiping Manny today, I don't know, but it's Jesus. Joseph actually won on the name thing here, so... They know that this child born to them is going to be the savior of the world. They don't really know how, but they know that it's going to be important, and they have a purpose and a mission. They're heading there for a reason. The reason is not for the registration, but it is to fulfill what needed to be fulfilled, going back to Isaiah, who prophesies about this. And he said to them, you know, this child will be born of a virgin, and she will be born he will be born of a woman who is a virgin and will be born into the house of David. So that's why Matthew spends all that time giving us the lineage of how Jesus is born of Joseph as a stepfather. But we also know, and this is something that has really come to light in more recent years, that Mary was probably also from the house of David. And if that's true, then all of those traditions would hold. But either way, they had a purpose to get to this town for for this baby to be born. They had no reservation. Inns in those days were not really hotels. They were bars, and they were taverns in which you could drink yourself to the place where you couldn't walk home, and therefore you just slept on the tables or on the floors or in the back room. And so literally no room in the inn meant that there, there were already all those people there coming in for the census who had already had a party and there was just no room or it wasn't a place to have a child born. So they were put off someplace in the back or around the corner. Many stories are told about this. One of my favorite stories is called Little One and what? Small One, Small one. okay. And uh, that's where it's all about the donkey's perspective, right? And there's a beautiful one, if you haven't seen it, called a, na- the, the Nativity Story. It's a live-action film, but it is done from the perspective, uh, and it is filmed in Israel itself. But anyway, these wonderful stories are always trying to depict for us this picturesque kind of thing that's going on in the manger. But I want to move to the final reason and the most important reason that any of this has happened and the reason why our Gospels are full of this story about the birth of Jesus. Mark, not so much. Mark is really about brevity, and if you read the Gospel of Mark, you're going to wonder if Jesus ever was born because he just sort of shows up. In fact, in Mark, we start with John the Baptist, and we start with this proclamation of the coming of Jesus, and he just shows up already already grown. But in Luke and Matthew and in John, we have this more fuller understanding of the importance of this. And that was that this is a journey of peace. I think peace might be one of the most misunderstood words in the English language today. Because we often think about peace as being the absence of conflict. Uh, Just like in a good relationship, we think that your relationship or our relationships are on a much better ground if there's no conflict, if we're not having to deal with stuff. And the truth is, if you've ever had a long-term friendship or a long-term marriage or a long-term uh, you know, parent-child relationship with somebody, that the lack of conflict is not the moment of peace. Because there's always something in a relationship, right? You either ignore it or you deal with it but there's always something in a relationship. Whenever you try to take two human beings and their souls and bring them together in some sort of covenant, there's going to be tension. So a great marriage is not a marriage that's with a lack of conflict it's, or tension. It's, a, it's when we get to a place where we're working on it and through it and we find those moments of peace when we know that we're actually making some progress. 
it's really a shame when we give up on those things. And we think, oh, I just, I don't have a peaceful marriage or I don't have a peaceful relationship because there's always something there. Well, there is always going to be something. We keep talking about peace on earth. Will there ever truly be peace from shore to shore, from pole to pole? I, I don't think so. But where there is this struggle, there are those who step forward with purpose, knowing that some things are extremely political and knowing that some things can actually cost you your life or your livelihood or at least your standard of living. Peace comes in the effort that is made to love beyond condition. I'm not quoting somebody right there. I'm just quoting myself. Peace is the, is the effort we take in loving someone or something that doesn't deserve it. Peace is in our heart as we process with life and as we take care of people and as we take care of communities. Peace comes when we know we've done everything we can and we can be at peace with that even though the results are not what we want. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but it is the management of conflict under the auspices of God's grace. So is there peace in the birth of Christ? Christ brings a whole lot of turmoil. It turns the whole religious community upside down and inside out. It, it brings the mighty power of Rome to its knees, but only at the cost of slavery and death in so many horrific ways to those who would proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. So it's so ironic that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, would bring more than peace. He would bring all sorts of torment in order for there to be a way forward for God's people, for faithfulness to win out over all the other powers that there are. That's why Jesus himself says, I did not bring peace. You think that I came to bring peace? I came to bring a sword, and it cuts both ways with truth and with severing some things that need to be ended. And so there's this ironic sort of dualism in peace. It's, it's about the effort to come forward and bring about a better life for others. I, I'll give you the most poignant example, but we were just in, um, we were just in Nashville. Stephanie and I were there. Um, and we, you know, besides working from Nashville, got to get out and do a little bit of touring, and we went to the Ryman Theater, Ryman Auditorium. The Ryman is a special place, and I want to tell you a little bit about the story of this, and I did not know pieces of this until just a few days ago, but Sam Jones was an evangelist who came to Nashville because uh, he, he got an audience pretty quickly when he put up a tent out there kind of north of downtown Nashville, and he held a nightly meeting, a nightly worship service in this tent, which is also a word for tabernacle. And so as he was preaching, he got really specific about how the Nashville in itself, while there was all this um, hooping and hollering going down there on Broadway, which those days was just a dirt road, but there, was, there were, the honky-tonkin' was happening a long time ago. So we got to go back to the late 1800s after the Civil War and after there was this integration that happened in Nashville where they had set up a fort to defend themselves from the Cherokee Nation and other Native Americans that were around there. But when they finally got to a place where there was some peace between the settlers and the Native Americans in this particular area of Tennessee, there was also this sort of uh, mentality that you know you, you that the West was going to win, it, and even though this was a Confederate state, they still were a little more progressive in terms of their inclusion of people that could live together in the same sort of community. Well, Sam Jones came along, and it turns out he was a Methodist pastor, and he was a Methodist evangelist. And he was out there preaching on the streets about hell and damnation and fire that would come down on people who did not, you know, heed the word of God. And 
be with people in ways that were important and loving and supportive. But here's the thing that was so interesting. As he got into his sermons, he also got political and he talked to talk about the heads of all these states and all of these people that were around there and all these folks with money. He talked about the one percenters and the five percenters. And as he got into this, he named a person named Ryan, Captain Ryan, who owned the largest number of paddle wheelers on that particular river. Um, not the Columbia, but the Cumberland River, which flows right through Nashville. Well, Captain Ryan heard about this preacher, and he went down there one night to set him straight about people who were sinners, and that he himself didn't consider himself in that evil group. And as he shows up, Thomas Ryman sits down to wait to the end of the service, and halfway through the sermon, he's down at the altar giving his life to Jesus Christ. Then at the end of the service, Ryman comes up to Jones and says something like, we don't know exactly, but, you know, um, you've been pointing your finger at people, but I, I realize tonight that I need Christ in my life, and how can I help your ministry? And Sam Jones says, well, <laughs> we need a building. <laughs> we need a place to gather people. So Ryman spends the next four or five years contributing and raising money, and they build what we now know today is the Ryman Foundation. In those days, it was called the Union Gospel Tabernacle. Interesting that they didn't call it a church because one of the, one of the precepts of this particular building was that everybody is welcome in this building. Every single person, black, white, Native American, immigrants, anybody who wants to come to our worship service can walk through the door. Kind of sounds like St. Matthew's. Sounds like a church that wants to be more. And a tabernacle simply from the Old Testament means a tent where God and people come together. And so that was the purpose of this auditorium. Right up through the days of the Grand Old Opry, they call this the mother church of country music. They call this the birthplace of bluegrass in this country. And being in the Ryman Auditorium, listening to a Christmas concert with Vince Gill and Amy Grant the other night, you could feel the history there. You could feel the 100 plus years, we're, we're even over that now, of people who have gathered for the purpose of coming to hear me, finding something more, finding God in the place. Look, peace is not going to come in our time or in our family or in us unless we look for a source beyond ourselves. I think we know who that source is. And I think we have the opportunity at Christmas this Eve coming up to just celebrate the fact that God has seen us through a tremendously difficult year and peace is possible. In fact, it's promised for both of us, for all of us. Amen. Thank you. Hello. There we go. We come. We come to the manger. We come and surrender. This is where we want to be. This is where we search. This is where we come in awe of your glory, Lord. We give thanks. We give thanks for the freedom to worship. We give thanks to to worship with the Camarillo United Methodist Church and our whole CalPAC conference and the universal church throughout the world as we approach the birth of Jesus. And Father, we have some praise to lift up and give you thanks for. We're so grateful that the Ford family, relatives survived a tornado that took three floors away above them, and we pray any injuries incurred will heal. We also pray for all those suffering in the tornado's path. We ask for prayers 
for Kathy as she goes to see a specialist this week for news and hopefully just good treatment on a very sore ankle. We are also, Lord, in search, search for people to grow our church, for the right people to come to St. Matthew's and help us deliver your message. We are praying and awaiting for people who are going through diagnosis. We are anticipating as people recover and heal from surgery they've already had. We are mourning those who have lost. We have lost, and we ask you to surround those families at this time. We are coping with health situations that are just ongoing for people, and we pray for strength as that continues. We offer praise that there are so many possibilities, that we're surrounded with so many specialists and doctors and health care providers, and we give praise for that as many of us are going through cancer treatment at this time. We also pray for peace, that peace that has been talked about today, for those in nursing homes suffering from dementia and those in hospice care. And Lord, we just give thanks that we can come to you with all these requests and know that you have already covered that and will cover that. At this time, we take a moment of silent prayer to pray for those in our hearts. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. this moment, we're going to take a moment to just think about our blessings and the way we can give back to God what he has given to us. Please stand for the doxology. these up to you in the hopes that it will carry forth the work that you would have us do in your world. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, The First Noel. <laughs>
but especially during this time where we might pause for a moment in all that we try to get done right before Christmas and know that the new year is only going to be on the calendar unless the new year, our promise of hope and peace and love that comes from God is realized in us. Oh Lord, make this be so. Amen. Oh. If you'd be seated right. for a moment, this is as good as we're going to show get. you yeah. a hey. quick video hey, here. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm so glad you came over today. Hey, we're, we're, we'll, we'll go ahead. ahead. That's yeah. okay. We've, We've been, been together, together sure. so we'll, we'll take, take that off. Good morning, How are you? Thank you. Oh, that's good to see you. Oh, Walt, how, how are you over here, here at Westlake West Village, Village and coming all this way to join us? I'm so glad. We're doing, We're doing great. great. We, we decided, decided to swing, swing by and check out your prayer labyrinth so that we could uh, take, take some, some time thinking about our family ministry, ministry program. program. Family, family ministry. Yeah. Wow. That, that is our that's great, that's a challenge. You know, you know in pandemic, pandemic times, it's, it's so hard for people to get together, together and we're trying to think ways to do that. Yeah, that's what we're thinking, too. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. But, but I, I heard, heard you talking, talking about family, family ministry. ministry. Yeah. 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 I, I have, have an epiphany. epiphany. I, I have, have some experience, experience in walking and working in a group of three. Ah. <laughs> That's, That's a good, a good one. one. Yeah. Why, Why don't you all work together? Now that okay. is a great idea. I, 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 think I think that really is an epiphany. epiphany. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could, could work, work together, together, couldn't we? All three of our churches. We, we could, could combine, combine our resources, our, our skill sets, and our parishes, reach out, expanding our programs into the community. There's just a, a number of things we could do that would really be impactful and helpful. Yeah, that would be super for us, too, because new to St. Matthew's, but new to the Canal Valley, we're, we're all part of the same community. So we are. It would be great for us to pull it together. And I think you started something at Thousand Oaks, right? Yes, indeed, indeed. We started a midweek uh, intergenerational Bible study where the entire family comes and uh, we have a meal together. We have a uh, three different Bible study, uh, Bible study sections where for children, youth, and adults. Right. And uh, uh, at the end of the Bible study, we come back together and uh, learn some songs and interact with one another. It's a great, great way for families to come together. It definitely is. I had the opportunity to bring my kids to your program for a couple of weeks, and they loved it so much. Thank you for your hospitality. Sure. They liked it so much that after the first week, they asked if they could come back. Oh, wow. I really celebrate when my kids ask to go to church, so that's a great thing. And you know what? I propose that we start doing this together come January. Right. Let's create a Kaneo Connect, Connect where we right. gather. And, and Anna, since, since you were the, you've, you've already, already done, done it once, would you be willing to host us first? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, so how about it. in January, we meet at your church on Tuesday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, the second Tuesday right. should be the start, just so that we can get back to the yes. There you go, the yeah. 11th. And, and then, then when we transition into February, February we'll host at Westlake Village. Good. And we'll move it to Wednesday nights. Uh -huh. All right, well then let's continue it here at St. Matthew's on Wednesday nights right after Ash Wednesday. And we'll do our Lenten study together here as well with the whole family. Wow. I'm excited about this. I'm, I'm ex and I'm thinking that there are other things we could do if this really gets gets going and our parishioners like it and there's excitement about it. We could we could do more with our youth, art, like in Newberry Park, or music ministries that uh, Westlake likes so much. We could combine our... Parishes and, and work, work on those things. things. We, we could, could do, do confirmation. confirmation. I like that. Or confirmation yes, yes. For ourselves. And we, we could, could really impact our community if our three congregations were to step out in some service ministries to the West Canal Valley. I am so excited to see where God leads us next, all together. Amen. Come and join us. Come join us. That wasn't staged at all, no. <laughs> it just shows pastors are bad actors, but uh, we are going to do this. Uh, we're, we're geared up, and we're going to start on the 11th of January, and it's going to start over here at uh, Thousand Oaks Church, and it includes dinner and intergenerational uh, experience, and then we're going to have going off into our separate areas for youth and children and young adults and adults. And then we come back at the end, and the kids teach us a song, or they teach us some sort of dance for that night, and we, we help them out with that. But this is 
the beginning of us starting to look at family ministry together because we have so much more power when we've got 50 people in the room and a critical mass for our youth and for our children. So we're really looking forward to this. There'll be more information about this coming out, uh, but it is starting on the 11th. And I believe it'll be a Tuesday night uh, over there at Thousand Oaks. It'll move to Wednesdays for the other two churches. So more about that later. Anyway, I'm very pumped about it. And we have uh, Life of the Church, and thank you so much. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. You got that one or this one? Oh, you got a mic for me? Thanks. All right. That's on. Hello. Hi, guys. So, so much is going on in Life of the Church. Board family, thank you so much for stepping up. And uh, helping uh, Pierre finish this Christmas cantata, choir, you sounded beautiful. And if you haven't heard enough music, tomorrow night uh, at 7 p.m., Dr. Ryan is conducting Handel's Messiah, a sing-along at Calvary Westlake, 7 p.m. tomorrow night. So make sure you come and see that if you'd like a little more Christmas spirit in your life. Looks like I have a beard. Crazy. I know. It's like tragic uh, pandemic issues. All right. Um, on the 21st, we're going to get together and wrap our arms around our dear friend Marv Jacobson and celebrate the life of Judy. We do need some donations of hors d'oeuvres and desserts, so please contact Janice McMahon to help out with that. We want to celebrate that beautiful lady's beautiful life and wrap our arms around our friend. On the 24th, Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, and it will be streamed to our... The Wesley Room. To the Wesley Room. Oh, nice, for extra. Okay, I love that. And the office will be closed on Christmas through New Year's, but if you need anybody at church, you can call because they do get direct messages. So... Don't hesitate to call, but the live office will be closed. They'll just be answering messages. We're going to start that back in uh, in January. We'll the, be back men's the men's study yep. is going to come back in January. That sounds great. All right. A good time to do that. And Conejo Connect. Didn't that sound awesome? Yeah. First meeting starts January 11th, and it's not just for young families. It's for all families. Excellent. So that's everybody in our church family. So that sounds like a lot of fun. I want to congratulate Ralph and Marilyn Matthews for their 58th wedding anniversary. The beautiful altar flowers. I mean, 58 years, that is a success. Am I right? Because I don't know. Sometimes I can't stand next to Ralph more than 10 minutes. (laughs) Just kidding. I love you, dear friend. (laughs) I love you, dear friend. Congratulations. I'm so very happy for you. And congratulations go to one of my angel dancers. Can you believe this? Tabitha Dyer got engaged. Yes, and even better, to one of my football players, Vincent Carrion. They've been dating for a long time since high school. So they are engaged. Congratulations, Debbie and family. We're so happy for you. Birthdays. Happy birthday, Kevin. And on the 20th, Sid Suggs. And on the 22nd, Steve Curtis and Carrie Wilson. On the 24th, Mariah Jacobs and Keith St. Amand. Oh, and on the 25th, Jesus. There you go. go. No big deal. The whole reason we're here. You know. Um, And also, Pierre is celebrating his birthday on the 28th. So am I missing anybody? Anybody else? Oh, when is your birthday? Coming up on the 31st, we're going to celebrate you next time we get together. I love it. A New Year's Eve baby. That's the best. All right, guys, let's sing. (laughs) You sing to yourself, Kevin. Special message for us today, Nathan. Come on up. Here you go. 
All right, good morning, St. Matthews. I do have a special uh, message on behalf of SPRC. We want to recognize our uh, staff members. Uh, last week, we were able to recognize Pierre, um, and then uh, because that was his last Sunday with us. Uh, so we were very fortunate to um, be able to have the boards and Ryan uh, conduct. Didn't feel like it was like he'd never left, right, Is that, as, as the director. So thank you so much. Let's give him another uh, round of applause. Um, And they have a big concert this week, right, that, that you're in the middle of, right? So we tomorrow really night. appreciate Is that Tuesday night? Is, tomorrow, you wanna, night. Tomorrow, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. So, yes. So we really appreciate you carving out the time for us. Um, and uh, being with the choir and, and so that we can have this event uh, today. Um, and they sang beautifully. Um, but behind al also, behind all those beautiful voices, um, was also our accompanist, right? and uh, playing all those beautiful riffs. Um, and so we do have a gift for him, and I just want to read what we put in the card. So first of all, Kevin, Merry Christmas uh, to you and your family. Thank you for shaping um, or sh uh, sharing your music, musical talents and gifts with our church. Your piano playing brings joy to the world, especially to St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. These mu music ministry of St. Matthew's uh, brings each one of us closer in relationship with God and helps us to be inspired and moved to share the good news and hope that Jesus Christ brings to us. You are a blessing to our church and may, may, you, enjoy, uh, may you enjoy joy and peace in 2022. So Amen. on behalf of SBRC, thank you. Um, yes, please. Uh, and um, inside there, you have to kind of find uh, our gift there, but also our uh, the gifts of our church, uh, providing some messages to you, Kevin. Uh, so there's notes of appreciation in there. And I want to thank uh, Linda for helping organize that. And she'll be up here joining me next uh, on Christmas Eve uh, for another special uh, a staff member of ours, our pastor. So we'll, we're going to hold off on that. But we also have another important uh, person that we want to recognize uh, for Christmas. Um, and that's our very own dear uh, Debbie. Um, so I will read what's in there, and then I'm going to ask her to come up and, and uh, Julian can give her your card. And we also have uh, the church's uh, gift of um, their uh, words in here as well. So, um, so dear Debbie, uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Uh, thank you for, for sharing your gifts, talents, dedication, and faith with our St. Matthew's United Methodist Church as part of our staff. Time after time when our church has faced new challenges such as the pandemic, uh, and also even uh, a transition to a new pastor year, you have stepped up to help us pivot and kept our church operating smoothly. We want you to know how much we appreciate you and all that you do for our church. You are a blessing. <laughs> you moved on me. <laughs> you are a blessing to our church. We look forward to joy and hope for you, you and your family in 2022 and a marriage. Congratulations in 2002. So. So thank you all of you for the, um, all the gifts that you share to us. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, St. Matthew's family. Welcome home.